last uh, week, uh, last Thursday, uh, I have a two-bay garage, uh, and uh, one of my uh, garage doors malfunctioned. And since I'm not really into fixing garage doors per se, because they're, they're steel doors, they're really heavy, I don't want to get killed, uh, I just uh, passed on that one, and I called uh, a door service to come deal with this thing. While I was cleaning my garage up from uh, the six weeks of uh, all the construction workers setting up in my garage to remodel my kitchen. So it took two weeks to clean up all the dust that was in my in my uh, garage. So I was going around cleaning uh, the garage and waiting for these guys to show up. And it was kind of a miracle. Remember how they give you like a window? Like we'll be there between 8 and 5. And they're always there at 4.45. Yeah. They, they always come at the end of the day for me. Uh, these guys showed up first thing. It was totally awesome. Uh, they showed up, and uh, I went out to the street to talk to them. Uh, it was two, two men, uh, a little bit older guy and a little bit younger guy. Uh, and I was talking to them out by their truck uh, and just, you know, kind of sizing them up, you know, what they were doing. Pretty apparent that one was the, the more seasoned veteran between the two door people, and the other guy was a younger uh, trainee. Uh, and so I, I was uh, talking to him about in the street, and I was looking at the trainee, and I noticed that he had some, uh, some tattoos on his body. Uh, coming from California, most of my other church was a was a blue collar church with a few white collar people, and I had a lot of former convicts and things in my church. So I was used to talking to them about their tattoos, and they don't attack you when you ask them. I'm alive, um, and so I asked the young man some you know some questions about his life, and while the other guys getting all the tools together, uh, and I said, "Hey, where, you know, where'd you go to school?" And he said, "Well, I you know I recently graduated uh, from the University of Virginia, uh, and I got a degree in anthropology." And I'm thinking to myself. Anthropology, installing doors, two totally different things, correct? Uh, yeah, and so I mean, okay, there's kind of a disparity there. Uh, and so I said, you know, hey, what do you plan on doing with your, li- with your life, with your degree? Well, I haven't quite figured that out yet, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working on it. And until then, I realized I need a job. Uh, and so I took this job, and, and they're showing me how to do this as I work out my plans. And I said, hey, it's great to see a young man uh, that is uh, really into work and understands the value of work. That's fantastic. I said, hey, could you explain your tattoos to me? And he said, oh, absolutely. And I said, well, the hourglass on the inside of your forearm, I find most intriguing. Took up the whole inside of his forearm. Um, it had some wording on it. It was upside down, so I couldn't read it. I can read Hebrew, but I couldn't read upside down English. So I'm like, what is, what is that say? And uh, he says, well, it, it reminds me when I look down at my forearm uh, that uh, all of us are given so much time in a given day and we shouldn't waste it. What do you do with a statement like that as a Christian? Uh, that's called an open door, is it not? <laughs> And so I, I said, well, that, that's absolutely true. I said, God does give each one of us a certain amount of time. Uh, and it's very important what we do with that time. I mentioned God. Uh, they then wanted to know two things. Number one, why are you talking about God? And why are you off on a Friday? Uh, and I said, well, I, I, you know, I pastor a church. Oh, really? Oh, so that's why you, you talked about God giving us time. And yeah, and we're still out by the tree, street. You know, I haven't got to my garage yet. So he had one more tattoo I found interesting. It was on the outside of his forearm. And I said, uh, wow, what, what, is, what does that particular name mean? He, and it was huge. I mean, it was like the whole side. He said, well, that's the name of my mother. It's tattooed on my arm in full color. And I said, well, you, you, must, you must love her dearly uh, to have her name on your forearm like that. And he goes, oh, yes, I do. I love her. She, she's meant everything to me in my life. And I'm who I am because of my mom. That's amazing, isn't it? So with that, we walked into the garage, and I started cleaning things up, and they started working on the door, and the older guy's up on a ladder doing all the work, the young guy's watching. Uh, and that, that's when it got really interesting, because they, they knew I was, uh, uh, what was my occupation? They knew I was a pastor, you yeah? uh, know? And so uh, the, the one young guy that was standing there, he's just kind of standing there watching the older guy, and he says, uh, hey, uh, pastor, I, I just got to make a confession. All of a sudden, my garage is a confessional booth. <laughs> I'll get to my sermon in a minute, Correct. Remember, I told you I don't wonder, all right? And so he said, uh, I, I just got to make a confession. He said, I, I realize I, I just really got to get back into church. I really do. He said, I left it a long time ago. I wasn't raised this way. I drifted from the church. I need to get back to church. Um, he says, where is your church? So I told him where it was. And then he, then he said, uh, could, can somebody like me come? Well, sure, we don't charge admission or anything. Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, sure, it's free. I mean, anybody's welcome to come. doesn't matter who you are. So you're welcome. I told him where it was, told him when the services were. Um, and he's like, man, I've, I've got to do that. And I said, hey, when you come, hey, look me up. 
You know, make sure, because I can't tell because of all the people if you're there. So please come uh, talk to me. Then the other guy working with all the wiring, on, uh, I didn't know he's really listening to us, but he's working on all the wiring and stuff and trying to fix this bolt. And he says, uh, well, you know, I think I need to get back to church myself. <laughs> it's like, it was really interesting. And then after he said that, the young guy then said to me, you know, I just want to be totally honest with you. He said, I, am, I really need to get back to church because I am scared to death to die. He said, I'm afraid of death. And I'm like, wow, both garage doors are open. Their lives are open. Uh, and, you know, and I, I looked at him, I said, you know, you don't have to be afraid. And he said, well, why not? And I said, well, because Jesus, who you were taught about as a child, is, is, came to be the savior. He bore our sin. He rose the third day. He's now the victor. And when you know him, there's no fear. And at the moment of death, he just comes and takes you right into his presence. Well, what could be fearful about that? Nothing. You know, it's interesting. Uh, and, and they eventually left my house. I mean, you can only go so far sometimes with how things go. And then he had to get back to work. Uh, but I had uh, done my job as a Christian in planting the seed of the gospel. That's your job. And you can convert any of those kind of conversations, uh, whether the, it was the one at Home Depot from last week. Uh, remember? Did you go talk to Muhammad this week? Or... Uh, or uh, like this, this young man, I think his name was uh, Dominique. Uh, you can easily turn the conversation to him because uh, they, they need Christ. Uh, and as I spoke to both of those uh, men in my garage uh, and having spoken with Muhammad the weekend before about Christ at Home Depot, the imam that I ran into, um, Psalm 110 is the answer to their questions. I mean, it absolutely is. Uh, because in Psalm 110, David, by way of prophecy, a thousand years before the Christ came, tells you exactly what he's going to be like, gives you his job description. And he tells you in the first three verses of Psalm 110 that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be the king of kings. That's who he's going to be. He's the king. He's the divine king of kings. Uh, and when a person embraces the king of kings, then he's not afraid of death because he knows that king is going to come take him. So the first three verses that we looked at last week uh, clearly articulate that Jesus is the Davidic messianic king when he comes. Um, and verse two, uh, just by way of review, tells you that when he does come, he rules out of Zion, which is just another code word for Jerusalem. That becomes his home base. Uh, we're studying the book of Revelation. We've taken a three-week hiatus uh, because of a variety of things. Uh, and so now we're back on track tonight at 6.30. Uh, and in Revelation chapter 5, and we're going to be in chapter 10, by the way, if you want to read ahead. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 10, in the book of Revelation, uh, this is what John says. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Those are Christians. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God uh, uh, and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. He tells you that when the Messianic king comes and sets up his kingdom, I'm going to tell you how long they're going to reign with him on that Messianic empire. Uh, this is a, the, what the scriptures teach. Uh, this is Revelation 26. I was going to read you 510. Uh, 5.10 says, Thou hast made them to be a kingdom of priests of, to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Speaking of Christians, you will reign with Christ. And that's what verses 1 to 3 are about. He's the great king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the Father to work in geopolitical situations to make everything perfect, to bring the tribulation, to then bring the kingdom. You ready for that? It leads to one question. Is Jesus your king? Is Jesus your king? Because if I were to ask that to those young men in my garage the other day, I think the answer would have probably been uh, no. Because if you know the king, you're not afraid of death, correct? Because you know the Lord of life. But the, the author uh, is going to switch gears in verses 4 to 7. He's going to head in a totally different direction. In fact, he's going to head in a direct direction that would make a Jewish person kind of raise their eyebrows. And go, you said, what? Because in verses 4 to 7, uh, by way of prophecy, David's going to move from the Messiah will be the king to the Messiah will be the high priest. No Jew would have totally got that one because that, as we're going to see, was antithetical to what they had been trained in the Torah. Verses 4 to 7 says this. says, the Lord is sworn, speaking of the Lord, which is capital L-O-R-D or Yahweh. Uh, this is God the Father. Uh, the, the Lord has sworn, and he will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever, speaking to the Son, the, the, the Adonai, the Christ. You are a priest forever according to the order, not of Aaron, but of who? Melchizedek. The Lord is at thy right hand. He will, now this is going from the Christ will be the king, the Christ will be the priest. And now the Christ as the priest is also going to be the judge. 
Because it says when he returns, it says in verse 5 through 7, the Lord is at thy right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Uh, in case I don't get to it, because I get too much into other things, drinking from the brook is probably the drinking from the Gihon Springs, which fed the waters of Jerusalem. I've been in the Gihon Springs area many times when we take people there. I'll take you there if you're coming with us to Israel, because this is where they coronated the king. So basically it's saying when the king of kings comes back and the priest comes back, the high priest Jesus, uh, and he deals with sin and wicked people and sets up his empire, he will stop at the end of all of that and take a refreshing drink from the Gihon Springs as they coronate him king of kings. I get chills just thinking about it because you're going to be there if you're a Christian. This is uh, kind of the deep end of the passage, but we want to dive into the deep end because who wants to stay in the shallow end all the time, correct? Do you, you ready for the deep end a little bit? Okay, let's, let's analyze this, what it says about Jesus being the king of kings. So this is, uh, uh, Jesus now is the priest, the high priest. So almost a thousand years before the birth of Christ in 5 BC, David makes a shocking statement that the, that the, the Messiah, when he comes, will not just be the king, he will be the high priest. Uh, the Torah never taught this that these would be wedded. And the high priest came from the Aaronic line and then a genealogical list within the Aaronic line, Aaron, the son of Moses, or the, the brother of Moses, uh, he would come from the line of Levi. So uh, to say that the priest is gonna come from a line other than the line of Aaron and Levi was like verboten. Like, what are you talking about? But that was the prophecy. Uh, years later, if you read the book of Chronicles, uh, chapter 26, and the difference between king, Kings and Chronicles, Kings covers the time of the Kings from political perspective. Chronicles covers the time of the Kings from a priestly pastoral perspective. That's the difference between those two books because they have similar information, but different viewpoints. In second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 16 to 23, it tells the historical account of Uzziah, the King who tried to usurp the role of the high priest. How'd they go for him? Uh, not well. God struck him immediately with leprosy on his forehead, began to go out through his whole body. He died covered in leprosy as a constant reminder the king does not traverse the boundary of the priest. But then all of a sudden, David has said years before Uzziah tried to become the high priest that when the Messiah comes, he'll be both of these things. So if you skip forward uh, some 500 years and you go to the book of Zechariah, which happens to be one of my favorite books in the Old Testament, uh, Psalm 110, the concept of the king of kings being also the high priest, as foretold in, I, through the pen of David, when you get to the prophet I, uh, Zechariah uh, around 519 BC to 480 BC, notice what he says in chapter 6 about, well, the coming Messiah. He says, take an offering from the exiles. This is a post uh, exiles that Jews were in captivity for 70 years after the kingdom of fell in 586 BC. Uh, and they're, they're attempting to rebuild the temple, but they're not redoing it very well. And at this point, Zechariah uh, gives them this word. He says, take an offering from the exiles, from Heldai, from Tobijah, from Jedidiah, and, uh, and you go to the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they have arrived from Babylon. And take the silver and the gold, make an ornate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, or Yeshua, which is just the precursor to Jesus. Put it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozak, the high priest. Huh? Why ever should we do that? He says in verse 12, Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. What in the world is he talking about? Verse three, 13 says this. Yes, it is he who, the branch, who will build the temple of the Lord. He's now told you that two times. Why? Because you probably didn't get it the first time. He's now told you someone's coming to build the temple far grander than what you guys are building. And he will bear the honor and he will sit and he will rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne and the council of peace will be between the two offices. What offices? The Messiah will be the king of kings and the Messiah will be what? the high priest when he comes. He'll be both of those things. He's given the prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah who will build his temple and rule and reign from that temple as prophesied in verses one to three of Psalm 110. Jesus is coming back. He's gonna fix the political mess. I mean, can't you see that needs to happen? No man can do it 
but only the God man can do it. And so he's coming back and he'll be the king with all power, the Davidic king to do it. And he'll be the high priest to handle all spiritual problems. He'll be both of those things. And so Jesus is coming back and he says it here in in verse 13. When it says, yes, it is he who will build the temple. Really in Hebrew, uh, this is called a vav disjunctive. It's when you take a a, a coordinating conjunction, vav, and you add it to a non-verb, like he, and you put it the first of the sentence, which they do in the Hebrew text. It doesn't start with the word um, yes. It starts with he. It makes it totally emphatic, meaning he's telling the, the Jews when the Messiah comes back, you better believe that he's going to do all this. It's going to be amazing. He's going to build the temple. What temple? The Messianic temple that Ezekiel prophesied in verses 40, uh, chapters uh, 40 to 48. He's coming. Leads to a lot of questions. One of them is, is he your king and is he your high priest? Is he your king and is he your high priest? What do you think the young man in my garage would have said? Well, he's not my king. And he's a what? A high priest? What does that mean? Well, he's your representative between you and the father. You need representation because you know you're fearful because you have no representation. I'm not fearful of death because I have representation with who? Jesus, who's the king of kings. He's mine. And because he's my high priest, he makes intercession. Awesome. But this leads to some logical questions like, uh, who's Melchizedek? Who would name their child Melchizedek? What what was the nickname? Mel. Yeah, I don't know. Melchizedek uh, is combined of two words. I told you, uh, as in as in German, where they staple words together, really long words to make one little word. Uh, They did this in Hebrew. So what they did is they took the word Melek, king, and Zedek, which means righteous, and they wedded it together to make the king of righteousness. That's his name. So every time the mother and father said his name, what were they saying? You are the king of righteousness. Imagine that child in your home. Uh, I love my name. My my parents named me Martin. Martin means warrior. Like, why did they pick that name? My dad, I think, wanted Scott. My mom picked Martin. You know, now I've got Martin. But it kind of fits. Warrior fits with kind of what I do. And so when you think about spiritual warfare, it's good. So Melchizedek, king of righteousness, who was he? Well, he was the Jebusite priest and king who ruled over Jebus, ancient Jerusalem. And he's the king priest who worshiped the one true God. In a, in a sea of polytheism, he was the king and priest over ancient Jerusalem. And when Abraham, Abraham uh, rescued his uh, nephew Lot and came back through uh, ancient Jerusalem and he ran into Melchizedek, what'd he do? Genesis 14, he gave him a tithe from the war booty. He gave him a a section of that and he he worshiped the one true God through the king priest Melchizedek. Well, who was Melchizedek? Well, he was a righteous man living in a very unrighteous environment and he's the great type of the Christ. Why? Because even before the Torah came and the Aaronic line was established for the priesthood, there was a high priest prior to them. What was his name? Mel. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Now, why is he so important? Uh, Dr. Alan Ross, uh, who taught me Hebrew at Dallas Seminary, said this about him. He says, because he, Melchizedek, was both king and priest, and because he was reigning in an old Jerusalem, he made the perfect prophetic type of the Messiah, whom the prophets declared would be both king and priest. Absolutely, he's the perfect type. And so Aaron's line could have never been that which could fulfill the coming of the Messiah as king and priest because of all stated reasons I'm going to show you in just a minute. Uh, to, to get to the, the, the significance of Melchizedek, we have to jump to Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, and we're going to actually do the entire chapter 7 in one service. This is a miracle. It's never happened before in this church before. I usually get stuck on a couple of phrases here and there, and we slowly move our way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, uh, chapter 7 explains Melchizedek's priesthood and how it applies to Jesus. Because remember Psalm 110 says when the Messiah comes, he's going to be two roles. What are, what's the first role? King of kings and high priest. High priest. So uh, the author of Hebrews is going to come along and say, let me talk to you about how superior uh, the role of Jesus is as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So I'm going to show you a chart uh, that I put together. Hopefully you can see this. Can you see, can you see that? My vision's always blurry. So can you see this? Yeah, you're so quiet today. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll try to explain it to you. So uh, this particular chapter, I'm going to have to summarize the argument of the chapter. Uh, to, to, uh, but if you want to get down to the details, you know, uh, I'll leave that for you. But I want to summarize why, why Christ is such a superior high priest. So in the, there's three panels, three structural panels in chapter 7. So the first panel is, 
um, verses one to four, the, uh, is that Jesus is the superior high priest because of those three stated reasons. Uh, and these are what I would call assets and liabilities. So he, his reign as high priest has tons of assets. Uh, and then when you get to the middle panel, it's the liabilities of the inferior Levitical uh, priesthood that doesn't even compare to Christ's priesthood. And then he closes out his whole argument. It's kind of like a sandwich. Uh, and he closes out his whole argument with, well, let's look at the assets of Jesus' priesthood as opposed to that of, of the Aaronic line. Why would you want something inferior? I mean, when you go out shopping for stuff, are you looking for, I just want the most inferior thing I could find. Is that how you shop? I mean, do you get like consumer reports and read all the stuff? And I've done this many times and you know, I, I'm going out looking for things. What, whoever owned my house before me, they, they kindly left us lots of stuff they should have probably taken with them. Never happened to you? And so there's all this stuff in my garage, these chemicals and things. I'm like, what is this? Uh, and there was a bottle of this stuff. And trust me, I've looked it up and they don't make it anymore. It is Primo. I will not loan it to you. I won't sell it to you. This stuff will clean anything. Because when I try to clean my gutters when they get black from all the weather here, I have tried everything to get that. You know, have you gone up on the ladder trying to get that stuff off? I mean, really get it off? Uh, and this stuff, I put it on a rag one day and it was like magic. It took the dark black stain on my gutters and just, they were like brand new. So this stuff is like in my garage, like gold. It's like superior to every other cleaning product I have. Why in the world would you want that which is inferior? So when you look at uh, your relationship to God, you wouldn't want something inferior to try to get you into his presence. You would want that which is superior. Well, that's Jesus. So he is a priest, a superior. Why? Well, let's look at panel one. He is both king and priest. He's both of those things. This is something that Aaron never could be. He was just a priest. Jesus is both of those things. Why? That's what Isaiah prophesied. He'd be the Davidic king, and he would also be the, the high priest. Uh, number two, he comes from a timeless man. Because when you look at Melchizedek, Melchizedek, it says, had no father, he had no mother. It's as if he always was. Because Jews are really big in the genealogy list. If you read through the Old Testament, I can tell you where you get bogged down. Have you ever tried this? I'm just being honest. You're just zipping along, you know, through you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Kind of slow down there a little bit. Uh, numbers, uh, okay. Then Deuteronomy, uh, that's okay. And then it, you start getting bogged down because you start running the genealogical list. There isn't one for him. And so it's like he's timeless, like Jesus. And also in verses 4 to 10, remember I'm summarizing. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And so when, the argument is, when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, who was in the loins of Abraham but Aaron, Levi? It's as if they paid tithes. So who's superior? Well, Melchizedek is. He's superior. So that, that's basically the argument in the first panel. The second panel we want to look at is the inferiority of the Levitical priesthood because it was going to go away and be replaced by the superior as prophesied. So when you look at the, the second panel, uh, in the first verse of, of that panel, verse 11, it, it tells us that uh, it's inferior because the Aaron's line provided incomplete access. I mean, it was incomplete. Verse 11, I'll read it to you. Now, if perfection, it's conditional, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, people received the law, what further need was there to be another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek, as prophesied, and not to be designated according to the order of Aaron. I mean, if you could get spiritually perfect before God through the Aaronic line, you wouldn't need Mel, correct? You wouldn't need Melchizedek. You would just need Aaron. But he couldn't provide total cleansing of you because there was imperfections about it. So constantly you're having to bring an all, uh, to the altar a sacrifice. Constantly. It was perpetual. Number two. Uh, verses 12 to 14. He says, uh, it was also transitory. Uh, Mel Melchizedekian line was not transitory. It's eternal. Aaron's was transitory. It says, for when it, the priesthood is changed from Aaron's line to line of Melchizedek, uh, it, it is of necessity there takes place a change of the law So also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe i.e. Judah, Jesus, from which no one is officiated at the altar. Why? Because the line of Judah, they were, they were kings. They weren't priests. Verse 14, he says, For it is evident that our Lord is descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. 
So he says, by definition of the fact that you have prophesied in Psalm 110 that the, Jesus would be two roles, role one, king of kings, role two, high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, just because it's prophesied tells you that when he comes, you got to change the Torah. Why? Because the Torah was fulfilled in that Christ, in that Savior. So that makes uh, Aaron's line inferior. Number three, he says it was, uh, in verses 15 and 19, it was, uh, well, it was earthly and temporal. He says in verse 15, and this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, that's going to be Jesus, who has become such not on the basis of the law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, and he's going to quote Psalm 110, thou art forever a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of the former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is bringing of a, into a better hope through which we draw near to God. What did the young man lack in my, in my garage, or both of them? Hope. <laughs> they lacked hope. They, uh, they didn't have hope. Why? Because they, they hadn't drawn near to God. Because he says, if you draw near to God with the superior sacrifice of Jesus, you have hope. Number four, says the high priest, uh, uh, Jesus, had a new uh, oath guaranteeing him the office. Aaron, his line, never had that. He never had that. It says in verse 20, and inasmuch as it was nothing without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he, speaking of the Messiah, with an oath through the one who said to him, quote, the Lord shall not change his mind, thou art forever. So he's quoting from Psalm 110 again. So much more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Why was Aaron's line uh, inferior to the superior of Christ's line as a Melchizedekian priest? Well, Jesus had an oath. Who'd the oath come from? The father himself. So when the father told the son, you're gonna, you're gonna become the king of kings and you are going to become the high priest of all high priests for sinful mankind who come to you in faith. I give you my word as your father, this is gonna happen. If your dad ever set you down and told you, son, I'm going to give you my word that X is going to happen in your lifetime. And you know your dad is good for it. You're not going to question your dad. I mean, when my dad gave the word, of like a promise to me or an oath to me, I knew my dad was going to be good for that, that I didn't have to worry about that. Christ is superior to the ironic line because of that, that very oath. God, the father gave the son an oath that your line will be the line for all time. Now you got to flip around, look at panel three. Remember there's three panels. Panel three, he talks about the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Number one, he serves as our high priest before the Father. Why? Because, well, death has no hold on him. Verse 23, and the former priests, uh, on the one hand, existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. I mean, one day I'm going to die and I get replaced here, correct? You're so quiet. Yeah, yeah. none of us are getting out of here alive, correct? I mean, barring the rapture. Yeah, so one day I die, whatever, retire, I get replaced, etc. So same thing with the priests in the Old Testament. They can only serve you for so long, and then, oh, we lost Yehuda, and we got another guy. Uh, not so with Jesus, because he lives forever. So look at verse 23. The former priests existed in great numbers, but they were prevented by death from but continuing. But he, Jesus, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Why wouldn't you want his priesthood? It always is. It was in the past, it's in the present, and it's in the future. So when Jesus is your Lord and your Savior and your King of Kings and your High Priest, why would you fear death? Well, because he's always there to intercede before the Father for you. Number two, verse 25, Jesus offers eternal forgiveness, not temporal forgiveness. Verse 25, hence also he also is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for you. Why is he having to make intercession? Well, because the devil's there. What's the devil doing? Well, the devil's coming there and bringing accusation against you. Hey, have you considered Marty? <laughs> yeah, I got, a, I got the dirt on him. Yeah, and Jesus steps in and goes, oh, no, 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 that's my son. Yeah, and I love him, and I, I died for him, and my, my sin, his sin is covered by my blood. You know, you be gone, devil. See, Jesus is constantly uh, dealing in his court of law with the devil, and that leads to another question. Why is he allowing there? That's another sermon for another day, but this is what Jesus does. Wouldn't you want him making intercession for you before the Father? See, why should you, why should you fear death when Jesus is your intercessor? 
what the young man lacked in my, uh, in my garage? He didn't have hope because he hadn't drawn close to Christ the King of Kings and Christ the High Priest. And the day that he will do that is the day that he has great hope because Christ will always be there uh, to, to make intercession for him. Number three, verses 26 to 27, it says, Jesus as the God-man lived the perfect and holy life. Made, it made him the perfect priest. You could pick, okay, we have a number of pastors on staff here. Are any of them perfect? Now you're talking. Yeah, well, no. Yeah, no, none, of us, none, of us, none of us are perfect, correct? There, there's no way I could live a perfect life until tonight when I go to bed. There's no way, right? Something's gonna happen. Something's gonna happen. You know, I, I'm gonna think something that's evil. I mean, it's just gonna happen. Jesus was perfect. Thought life and actions, always, 24-7. It's perfect. So that makes him loftier and better than Aaron ever was because Aaron, Aaron had clay feet. He might've been a high priest, but he had clay feet. So it says in verse 26, for it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, Jesus, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted into the heavens. Who does not need daily like those priests to offer sacrifices? He didn't have to. Why? Well, because he was perfect. He was sinless. Makes him far greater than Aaron. And number four, fourth reason why Jesus is superior, uh, he was not only the king, he was not only the priest, he's the sacrifice. He's all those things all at one time. Notice what he says. He says, he did not offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath from the father to the son, which came after the law appoints the son made perfect forever. What did Jesus do? Well, he took your sin and my sin on the cross and he bore that sin as the sacrifice. There were, always, there were always kings, Davidic kings, there were priests, but there was never any one of those who said, I can also be the sacrifice for the sins of the people. This is, a, this is exactly what Isaiah 53 talks about, if you want to read it. When I, my Jewish sister-in-law asked me one time after Liz's twin sister died when she was 33, and she, Martha came back by her house to talk to us, she wanted to know from me on the patio that evening, how in the world could you think that Jesus was the Messiah? I said, well, have you not considered your text? And I took her to Isaiah 53. And when we were done studying Isaiah 53 on my patio, my Jewish sister-in-law said, I have never heard these things before. Well, you need to hear them because this is who Jesus is. He's the sacrifice. He's the king. He's the high priest. And he's the sacrifice. That leads to a logical question. Is he your sacrifice? Is he your sacrifice? Because the day he becomes your sacrifice is the day you walk into his, his family. And I, I say that uh, you must come to terms with these things. What are the three questions? Is he my king? Right? Is he my king? Is he my high priest who intercedes between me and the Father and gives me holiness? And is he my sacrifice? Because the moment he becomes those years in, years in faith, you are his child. Apart from that, you have fear. Why? Because you're on your own. And you should have fear because of what it says in the closing verses, and I'll read them to you. The closing verses, after it talks about his priestess, it says in verse 5, the Lord is at thy right hand. This is Adonai, this is Jesus. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men, the politicians, over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head in basically saying, lift, lift up his head victory. This is Jesus when he returns. The first time he came, he came as a, as a lamb, did he not? He came as a lamb to be the sacrifice. The second time he comes back, he comes back as a what? As a lion who's going to deal with sin and sinners and the devil. Revelation 19, which we will get there sometime in our lifetime of studying the book of Revelation, says this about Christ's coming. It says, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his, his eyes are a flame of fire. Why? Because he's mad at the evil that he has seen for thousands of years. It says, and upon his head were many diadems, and his name was written upon him, which no man knows except he himself. It's a special name. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, uh, clothed in fine linen, this is a code word for Christians, saints who are in heaven with him, uh, white and clean, were following on him on white horses. We're coming back with Christ. 
Uh, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may with it smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh is a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. You know, I would rather be, I get, I'm really, I get chills just thinking about it. I would rather be behind Jesus on a horse than in front of him because he comes as the judge. Be not deceived. He, if you follow some other kind of system of belief that you think will get you into his presence and it denies that he's the king, denies that he's the high priest, denies that he's the sacrifice, you shall not see him. But if you embrace those by faith, you shall see him. I close with a gardening analogy that hit me the other day when I was working in my front yard. So I have a picture on my mailbox. If we could see the picture on my mailbox, they probably turned me off. Yeah, this is my bell box. So around the base of my mailbox are uh, four o'clock flowers. Uh, and I put them there because my uncle that fought in World War II, uh, my uncle Walter, he, he loved four o'clock in South Carolina. So I got seeds years ago and I've kind of perpetuated it for the last, I don't know, 30 years. Four o'clock, I don't, they're awesome. I love them. It looks like a whole bunch of four o'clock, huh? I want to show you the, the next picture. Now that looks like four o'clock, but I forgot my clicker, but uh, do you see down the bottom right there? Do you see that little plant down there in the bottom? Do you see how the leaves are skinnier? Is it four o'clock? It's not four o'clock. It's a weed. <laughs> this is verboten in my yard. This is a weed. It looks exactly like four o'clock. I'm thinking I'm out by my mailbox the other day. It's like, this is a spiritual experience. Because what does the devil do? Jesus has sown the truth in the world. I am the, I'm the king. I'm the priest. I'm the sacrifice. Come into me and be saved. And what's the devil do? Let me throw a couple of weeds in there. If you believe a weed masquerading as the true thing, you need to pull the weed and embrace the, well, the Messiah who's the true plant of righteousness. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to, to look into the, the deeper waters of Psalm 110. Uh, but we know that you can take these concepts and apply them to different lives in different places in different ways. Uh, use your scriptures to embolden saints to share the gospel. And may it move those who don't know you, like the young man in my garage, uh, to come to Christ in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Good to have you in God's house of worship.